Hi, everybody. I'm Danny Fingeroth. Welcome to a Will Eisner Week special event. It's a presentation um, about the life and legacy of Will Eisner, the, we call it the spirit of comics, um, around the uh, Will Eisner Week headquarters. We also call it Eisner 101 um, because that's uh, what it is. going to give you kind of an overview of Will Eisner's life and career and, and uh, kind of explain what's so, what was so special and what is so special about Will and his work and his legacy that we have a Will Eisner week. This is uh, the spirit of comics, the legacy of Will Eisner, and that is a uh, one of the more famous uh, illustrations of Eisner's character, the spirit, uh, and we'll talk more about the, uh, about the spirit as we go on. This is this year's uh, Will Eisner week poster. Uh, many of you probably have them. If you'd like them, uh, get in touch with us at willeisner.com and we can supply digital files and uh, possibly uh, printouts of them as well. This is a drawing Will did several years ago um, and we thought it would make a great um, uh, poster for Will Eisner Week. We have a new poster every year and um, the theme of Will Eisner Week is always honoring the legacy of Will Eisner who is known as the champion of the graphic novel, and it's dedicated to promoting graphic novel literacy, free speech, and the sequential arts, which are all things that Will fiercely believed in. If uh, the spirit uh, was a character that Will invented in 1940, we'll talk more about him, but certainly the spirit is one of the things he's best known for, as are the graphic novels that he did uh, later in his life, and for the last uh, 25 years of his life, this is his first and probably most well-known graphic novel, A Contract with God. Uh, this is the cover to a later edition uh, from the Will Eisner Library that was done uh, with, uh, with and through, I believe, DC Comics. This is Will Eisner as a young man, um, probably in his 20s, uh, working actually on the uh, short-lived spirit newspaper strip. We want to give you a sense of what Will looked like in case you had met him or had seen him in his later years at a comic convention or a retailer's meeting. This was sort of Will uh, <clears throat> lit, very film noir. He could have been, uh, he could have been a scene from Citizen Kane at the uh, newspaper, um, but he wasn't. He was at his own studio. Um, Will was born uh, in 1917 on March 6th. Uh, World War I was still going on, and the Russian Revolution was going on, so it was a tumultuous time in the world. A um, couple of people also born that same year. This is, <coughs> excuse me, this is Jack Kirby, who would go on to, among other things, co-create the what we call the Marvel Universe. And uh, John F. Kennedy was also born in 1917, so to give you a sense in history of where Will uh, came into the world. <clears throat> Will was born uh, in New York City, uh, born in Brooklyn, although raised in the Bronx. Um, and some of the influences uh, on his work were people uh, and, and, and work like L.Z. Seagar's Popeye and uh, Harriman's um, Crazy Cat. Um, these were the kind of things Will was reading and everybody was reading. and and that he'd cited as imprinting themselves on his mind and on his creativity. Um, he also was very influenced by a guy named Lind Ward, who did kind of precursors to graphic novels. Um, and uh, this was a book of Ward's uh, called uh, God's Man. And um, you can sort of see it's got kind of a 30s feel and a, and, and a kind of ur- uh, comic book slash graphic novel field, and Will always cited Ward as being a big influence. Another big influence on Will, and on many others, both in the comics field and in other fields, was DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. Will uh, went to DeWitt Clinton, as did many accomplished people in many fields. Uh, it was an all-boys school, so perhaps because there were no girls to distract them, uh, whatever it was. It was also an enormous student body. At one point, it held 12,000 students. Um, and it was in the Bronx, so the students were all 
from the Bronx, was part of the New York public school system. Uh, other famous alumni, alumni include uh, James Baldwin, Patty Chayefsky, um, uh, either Lerner or Lowe or, Ro or Rogers or Hammerstein, but half of each of those teams, um, as well as um, Dan Shore of uh, both from PBS and CBS, many, many accomplished uh, uh, people, including in the field of comic books. Uh, this is some of Will's work as a teenager for um, various publications at DeWitt Clinton High School, I think the yearbook especially. And this is some stuff he did um, for uh, the uh, student newspaper. Uh, Commerce was another uh, big high school in New York City that, that also had uh, famous sports teams as did DeWitt Clinton. Uh, another person who went to school with, uh, actually a little after Will, but another Clinton um, attendee and alumnus was uh, Stanley Martin Lieber. Uh, you may know him as Stan Lee, who went on to do a few things in the comic book world. Also attending, uh, actually with Will, was the gentleman on the left, was Bob Kane, and on the right is uh, Bill Finger. The, uh, who was a few years older than Bob or Will, but together they created something called Batman. And, uh, you know, that went on to become fairly well known. Um, at one point, Eisner had graduated and he was looking for art jobs. He ran into Bob Kane and Kane was working for uh, a guy named Jerry Iger at an early uh, sort of hybrid comics and prose magazine called, Wow, What a Magazine. And uh, Eisner went up for an interview and he actually was very helpful to this guy, Jerry Iger, who was the editor and publisher of the magazine. The magazine was being published out of the back room of a garment factory in the garment district in New York. That's, that's the high regard that comics are publishing uh, had in those days. It would basically, anywhere you could find a space to publish them, they did. Um, Will helped Jerry out of a jam, uh, and Iger actually is um, one of his descendants, I think a nephew or grandnephew is um, Bob Iger of, um, of uh, uh, Disney. I think Will though was not related to um, Eisner who had been an executive at, um, at Disney. Uh, together, they did things both for uh, in, in WOW, although WOW only lasted a few issues, but they did stuff both for uh, an American market, they ended up doing a lot of stuff in England, um, and Will would use different names to give the illusion that they had a lot of artists working for them. And they worked in what now you would consider kind of a film noir kind of style. You could see the Lind Ward influence here, um, the influence of the movies of the day. Um, they packaged comics for publishers. In other words, the publishers that didn't necessarily want to hire a whole staff would hire companies like Eisner and Iger, which was the name of the studio. Um, and so Will was involved with the creation of Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Um, the, the signature there of W. Morgan Thomas was Will Eisner, as was Willis Renzi, as was Spencer Steele, and many other names that they used again, to give the impression that they were a big shop. Eventually they were a big shop. Here's uh, something, uh, Espionage starring the Black Ace, I believe this was published in England. Um, Hawks of the Sea by Willis Renzi. Um, so they did a variety of genres, a variety of styles. Um, eventually uh, everybody came to work um, for Eisner and Iger and later for Will. Um, people who went on to become big names uh, including uh, someone who the will the uh, in a, in a in a graphic novel called The Dreamer Eisner sort of does a Ramana Clay, that's a, a memoir, and he speaks here of how uh, Jack King, who is his thinly veiled Jack Kirby, came to work for him um, at Eisner and Iger, and, and many many people came through and were trained, especially by Will, uh, even after Will went independent into his own studio. The game changer in comic books really was Superman's mm -hmm. debut in action comics. Um, I call it the killer app. And really this was the first superhero. I know now with all the things we see with special effects and movies and TV and video games, the idea of somebody smashing, you know, lifting a car overhead and smashing it, 
doesn't seem like such a big deal, but it was a big deal then. And Superman created this superhero fad that many people were looking to cash in on. At that point, Eisner and Iger were successful and a newspaper syndicate called the Register and Tribune Syndicate wanted to get in on this comic book fad and this superhero fad. And they hired Eisner away um, Eisner sold out uh, to Iger. They had always had an agreement that one could buy the other out. And Will created this character called the Spirit that superheroes was so new that because he threw a mask on the character, you can't see it here, but you'll see it uh, in the next uh, uh, image. Um, because he gave him some of the accoutrements, a mask and a hat and a headquarters, it was enough to pass for a superhero. And the Spirit debuted on June 2nd, 1940, um, which was a full year and a half before America got involved with World War II. Um, but it was a, it, it was, it, and, and the Spirit was part of a, of a, of a, a 16 page comic book section that came to be called the Spirit section that would appear in newspapers. Um, if you remember how the newspapers years ago, but not that long ago had TV, listing sections that were a separate booklet. Now they have advertising uh, so, uh, you know, inserts. So the spirit was something like that. Again, attempting to cash in on uh, what was seen as a, as a superhero comic book fad and was. Superman was selling millions, Captain America was selling millions. Uh, from the very beginning, Eisner was known for his dynamic and dramatic layouts, um, for having um, for playing um, in a very, dare I say, spirited way with the character's logo. The spirit was never uh, Superman level popular, except it kind of was because it was in the newspapers. It was in, I think, about 20 newspapers at its peak, but when newspapers were at their peak, that means 5 million people of all ages, from the youngest children to the oldest uh, adults were reading newspaper comics and were reading the spirit. So um, it was sort of popular and not popular. So it wasn't uh, Dick Tracy level, I suppose, or Peanuts level if you take her later, but still five million weekly readers is pretty darn good. And it also got Eisner out of the daily grind. It put him in a, in a weekly grind of putting out this weekly 16 page spirit section. Um, but it got him out of kind of the comic book world. And so the, economic and political and, uh, and, and sociological uh, fire that comics came under, Will was managed to largely avoid them. Uh, and then again, you can see that this is a very iconic, famous uh, spirit splash page. This is what's known as the pre-war spirit, a little more realistically drawn. Um, and again, you see the logo would shift on a regular basis. Eventually, Will did regularize the logo. Um, his signature was certainly uh, has similarities to Walt Disney's signature, which I think Will was uh, some way trying to emulate. Um, after um, a couple of years, uh, Will uh, was drafted and ended up doing a lot of educational and instructional work for the Army. He was stationed at the Aberdeen Proving Ground and other places in the States. Um, and this, uh, so for them, he, and, and really all through the rest, uh, for, for the next, uh, for many decades, he did instructional comics for the army and for uh, corporations um, and for educational institutions and for government offices. Um, the idea was to teach soldiers and, and other, you know, and anybody else, how to do their jobs better, especially with soldiers more safely, so that their guns wouldn't blow up in their faces, so that jeeps uh, wouldn't stall in the middle of a, a, of a dangerous situation. And to always, Will always injected a sort of playful attitude towards it. So here's his character, Joe Dope, uh, imagining himself not, not as some um, dope uh, trying to put together uh, a jeep that's stuck in the mud, but as a noble uh, charioteer. After the war, uh, Will resumed. The spirit had been going on all along, but mostly done by assistance while Will uh, was, was in the service. He came back and really 
there was a whole sort of Orson Welles film noir feel um, while simultaneously becoming a little more caricatured. So this is one of the most famous um, uh, spirit section splash pages. I am Pigel, and this is not a story for little boys. Uh, Pigel, of course, was the red light district in Paris, but you can see the techniques Eisner is using. And the, and, in, and the spirit, while he was certainly active and took a lot of punishment, was very often almost a supporting character in his own stories. Uh, again, Eisner experimented with the splash pages, with the spirit logo. Here's the spirit logo from the 1949 story as an apartment building. Um, here's a, a spirit story from 1950 where the logo is, is part of a lamp outside of police headquarters. So Eisner always experimenting, always um, um, combining drama, humor, romance. Um, he was a comic book uh, creator's comic book creator. Everybody looked at what he was doing as he was innovating in story, in art, in format, um, in presentation. Um, and, and here were some more, we've seen some of his uh, comic strip influences. Will was also influenced, um, he often spoke of the photographs of Man Ray, which he would see at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York, and, uh, and Man Ray's experimental films as well. Um, I think everybody of Will's generation was influenced by Orson Welles, especially by Citizen Kane um, in the days before the VCR uh, or the DVD player, they would just go to the theaters and sit and, or, you know, and, and watch the movies over and over. And also, especially to the Museum of Modern Art to see a lot of foreign films or older movies that, that you couldn't see so easily. Um, Will incorporated this kind of noir look uh, into, um, into his work, and, and here's a really beautiful splash. Uh, yes, that is the spirit, that little figure walking through Black Alley. Um, you know, and Will, um, you know, you can, you can see, if you're familiar with his graphic novels, you can see the care and detail and attention he, you know, and, and the romance he had with urban life in, in general and New York City life in particular and even more specific with the Bronx uh, um, in, in super particular, you know, whether wherever he lived, because Will um, eventually lived in the suburbs and lived in Florida, but he brought New York with him. One of the reasons he later on wanted to teach in New York was I think, cause, you know, although he did have his office, uh, his business office in New York, but he always wanted to be sure that he came into the city and got his dose of New York and, you know, and worked and had an office and studio in Manhattan and, uh, and, and taught at SVA um, uh, and, and, and was able to just keep his, his connection to the city going. This is another page in that same story. And, uh, and you can see the, the, not just the camera angles, but almost the use of lenses with, as if, the, as if he was drawing uh, uh, with a camera as opposed to a, a pencil and brush. Um, and the wonderful thing here is the story, the spirit is the hero. Will is certainly no doubt, you know, who he sees as the good guys and bad guys, but he's astute enough to know that when somebody sees somebody being chased, their sympathy is gonna be with the guys being chased no matter what he's done. Look, a chase, it's a cop, the spirit. <laughs> Cops, run, Mac, run. Um, you know, this was Eisner and the city and, and, and and movies on paper, although he certainly knew he was, you know, he was proud that he was doing comics, which he later called sequential art. Will was one of the first people to ever talk of comics as an art form, which he did as early as 1941. Um, when other people were just looking at it as a craft and low level craft, Will saw its potential and demonstrated its potential. This was his favorite spirit story. It was the story of Gerhard Schnabel about, uh, a young man who discovers as a child that he can fly and yet his parents force him to suppress it his entire life. They don't wanna have their kid be weird and be known as a weirdo for flying. Um, and uh, here's some early experimentation Will did using photos and drawing and cutting up a lot of, Will believed and understood that lettering in a comic was 
took up real estate and, and took up design and was a very important part of what comics were and could be. And certainly here he demonstrates it. Um, and here's Gerhardt's novel as a child discovering he can fly. Um, so we, we're skipping near to the end, spoiler alert. So if you don't want to know how a story that came out uh, in, uh, in 19, around 1950 uh, happened, came out, then uh, avert your eyes. But he finally has had enough and he's gonna fly, whether his parents or anybody likes it or not. And he ends up in the middle of a, uh, of a chase that the spirit and uh, some other, uh, and the police are giving to some uh, robbers. And uh, one of the crooks is shooting at the spirit and nobody even notices Schnabel. You know, I'm flying, it's wonderful, I'm flying, but nobody's, no, no one's noticing. And he inadvertently gets shot while this other guy is, uh, is shooting at the spirit. And I guess he sees uh, Schnabel and the tension is diverted. And so lifeless, Gerhard Schnabel fluttered earthward, but do not weep for Schnabel, rather shed a tear for all mankind. For not one person in the entire crowd that watched his body being carted away knew or even suspected that on this day Gerhard Schnabel had flown. Um, you know, you can try to analyze why Will loved the story. I think he felt as much as he accomplished, maybe there was more that he wished he had accomplished, or that it was a metaphor for people he knew um, who were forced to keep their there a light under a barrel somehow. Um, but this was, he generally regarded as his favorite spirit story. This is a story called 10 Minutes. Uh, it was written uh, by Jules Pfeiffer, although Pfeiffer is always very careful about pointing out that anything he wrote for Eisner really was channeling Eisner, was edited by Eisner. And so um, fully uh, saw these things as collaborations. This is, um, um, what are 10 minutes in a man's life? Well, of course, that's what the story is about. And Eisner here creates a very New York, a very Bronx, a very uh, Jewish kind of uh, tenement milieu. Uh, it's a story of this uh, kind of perennial loser named Freddie who decides he's gonna change his life that day. Um, he's gonna rob the local candy store, which is kind of the sweet shop and the, and the and the soda shop and the, and the comic book and magazine shop all in one in those days. He uh, inadvertently kills um, the uh, proprietor who he's known since he was a kid and so all this tension builds up. He's trying to hide the body, but meanwhile, uh, other people come in, these kind of neighborhood, uh, neighborhood kids and um, Freddie just pretends that he's helping out and then the girl realizes there's a dead body. So. The way the, the, the story is constructed, the way Eisner builds the imagery and together with Pfeiffer, they create this incredible uh, scene. Again, I use the word film noir again, but it really echoes kind of the, the uh, most uh, fatalistic and, and, and grim of, in a good way, of those movies. Um, so this was the spirit at much of its height. That's Pfeiffer. Not quite those years, a few years later, working on his own Pfeiffer strip, it seems, but that's Jules as a young man, probably within a few years of when he was working for Will, because he came to work for Will uh, when, when he was still in high school. Um, and this is a story they did together called Deadline. And uh, in the story, uh, drawn by Eisner, but it's New Year's Eve, uh, the conceit of it's New Year's Eve, obviously, to have this published and uh, and be out on New Year's Eve. They would have had to do it weeks, if not months earlier. There's the spirit logo on the door. And there is uh, Eisner. Good evening, Mr. Eisner. Didn't expect to see you working on New Year's Eve. Neither did I. And Eisner is in the uh, studio and uh, a door opens and uh, a uh, angry revenge uh, driven assistant who's basically Pfeiffer as drawn by Eisner comes in and kills him and takes over the strip. And you certainly cannot accuse uh, uh, Pfeiffer of being vain because this is not the most uh, flattering uh, portrait of Jules ever drawn. And I'm sure he must have seen the art before it went out. And then the editor calls up and, uh, and the, the, the unnamed assistant says, for years all I've been doing is sharpening pencils, erasing pages, and drawing little children's pictures. I am better than all this. 
No more little children for me. I will draw a spirit story the like of which the world has never seen. So that was uh, that was the spirit, and that's that's a close-up color of Pfeiffer. So Pfeiffer may have killed Eisner in the story, but Eisner had his revenge in his drawing of of uh, Jules. Who, if you've ever met Jules, is much better looking than this. That this is Eisner in the mid '60s. Um, he'd stopped doing the spirit in in the early '50s. Got married. Was concentrating on uh, the corporate and military and instructional work. Um, but around this period, um, so this is Will, but in the mid 60s, still doing PS Magazine and other educational material. Uh, that is Connie Rod. And uh, apparently the um, GIs are all signing up to uh, help her with her car washing detail. All right, maybe not the most progressive uh, view, but it was 1951 and he was trying to get soldiers interested. Um, in the, but back to the mid sixties in 1965, Pfeiffer put out this book, uh, called the great comic book heroes, um, partly in order to revive, uh, interest in Eisner and Eisner's interest. And he reprinted while reprinting the origins of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, um, Captain America, the Submariner and so on with a very, uh, with a witty uh, text that I recommend if you haven't read the book. He also reprinted this spirit story of the spirit in a Middle Eastern bazaar on buildings, standing on buildings that just happened to spell his name. Um, and, uh, and Pfeiffer really clued in um, my entire generation, the baby boom generation, that there was such a person, was, was such a character and strip as the spirit, and there was such a person as Will Eisner. To put it in a little context, this is the same era as the Adam West Batman television show. So there was some interest in comics as pop art. And, uh, and, and so, and, and the Marvel revolution had happened for the past several years. So people were aware of Stan Lee and, and the Fantastic Four and uh, the X-Men and Avengers. So in the midst of this, um, Harvey Comics reprinted a bunch of Eisner stories, including, uh, a new cover by Will. And uh, this says the world's most outnumbered crime fighter returns. So I think because of the tongue in cheek nature of the Batman show, they were emphasizing the humorous aspects of uh, the spirit. Um, in this period, Eisner met up with an underground publisher named Dennis Kitchen. And Kitchen was a, a big fan of Will's and he started and he, uh, and, and, and um, started reprinting uh, some of, um, uh, of Eisner's uh, uh, stories under his own imprint, under Kitchen Sink. Um, and Eisner became very curious about the underground comics of the era, um, such as Zap Comics done by Robert Crumb. And he went to a comic book convention, which is where he met uh, Dennis, and he met Art Spiegelman, and Will tried his hand at a comic called Snarf that uh, that Kitchen put out. Uh, had the spirit and uh, Commissioner Dolan um, meeting uh, some of the undergrounds and uh, underground cartoonists. And uh, Will ended up both for Kitchen, uh, then for uh, Warren Publishing, and then later back for Kitchen, um, overseeing um, reprints of his original spirit material for which he did new covers. Um, and he also started experimenting with this new form, um, inspired by the undergrounds. He knew he wasn't gonna do sex, drugs, rock and roll because he was not that generation, um, but he had stories to tell. Um, and so we get to about 1978, which is the year the first Chris Reeve Superman movie came out. Oddly enough, it's the year that what has come to be called the Silver Surfer graphic novel came out um, but it wasn't, it was called um, The Ultimate Cosmic Experience. Uh, the covers by Bob Larkin, but the interior uh, story and artwork by Stanley and Jack Kirby, who had created the character um, years before at, uh, at Marvel. Um, so in that atmosphere comes a contract with God that um, was inspired by many things. And there have been other things called graphic novels, but this was really. Um, 
the work that put the, the, the term graphic novel on the map, uh, although oddly enough, it was four short stories, four novellas. But uh, the story goes that Will was showing it to a publisher he knew, and he knew if he told the guy he had a comic book, the guy wouldn't see him. So the guy, the publisher said, what do you got? And Will said, I got a graphic novel. And he came in and uh, the guy said, well, this is a comic book. Uh, so, um, uh, but Eisner ultimately found a small publisher uh, to put it out and it's been in print ever since. Um, and this was, um, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen these pages. This is a story um, about a uh, elderly Jewish man in the Bronx uh, set in the 30s who had just uh, lost a teenage daughter and uh, believed that he had, as a young man, made an agreement that if God requires men honor that ag agreement, then is not God also so obligated? About a man who believed that he had served uh, his God uh, in, in such a um, outstanding way that God would never let anything bad happen to him, and yet he lost uh, a teenage daughter. And so this story is about that and his loss of faith and what happens to him. Um, and here Eisner's experimenting with techniques. You can sort of see he's not going so much for the strange angles, and yet he is fully aware that the lettering has its own life and takes up space and is a design element. He's eschewing, for the most part, um, strict panel borders. And then he's doing that incredible photographic thing in the last panel with that, uh, that light, black lightning against the white sky, the way you, if you saw lightning. So there's all sorts of experimenting going on here. Um, Eisner did it at a smaller size, not twice up. He did it almost printed size. If you've seen it, it's the size of a trade paperback. This is another story in the book called Kuhalain. It's about um, young Jewish uh, Bronx residents going up to the country, also known as the Catskill Mountains, to get away from the oppression of the summer heat. There's a certain amount of social climbing here. It's also a story about a very thinly disguised uh, Will Eisner losing his virginity to an older woman that summer and coming back to find that his parents have split up and that uh, this year you're gonna have a lot of, lots of responsibility around here. Your father is gonna be uh, traveling a lot. And this is the city, the city that Will loved, that he came from as much a character in his graphic novels um, as, as, any, as any character. And, and so this in many ways, while there are many precursors to the, to, you know, and many claims on who did the first graphic novel, this really put the phrase on the map, what Will called sequential art. Will would go on to do pretty much one a year uh, for the next 25 years, literally uh, until he died in, uh, in 2005 at age 87, almost age 88. To the Heart of the Storm is one of the, um, is one of the better known ones and, and, and one of the more admired ones. It's, it's his most uh, overtly autobiographical uh, graphic novel. Um, it's framed by, uh, by his going off to army service. And, uh, and, and, and it goes back, it tells the story of his life, his father's life, maybe even his grandfather's life. It, it jumps back and forth in time. I single out this one panel just because I always like, um, it's explaining how Eisner, you know, was able to get along with the, all the different ethnic groups in his neighborhood, not get beating up, not getting beaten up, often by drawing for them. And so um, what the kid says is, uh, 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 the Eisner kid is saying, I'll be right up as soon as I finish this drawing. And the other kid, another kid goes, wow, he drew Lindy's airplane. Lindy's airplane means the spirit of St. Louis. And this was before Lindbergh became a, uh, a um, German sympathizer and uh, an isolationist uh, leading up to World War II and a famous anti-Semite. Um, you know, I think kids of that era were inspired by him having done that, uh, that, that transcontinental flight, being the first one to do that. So the spirit of St. Louis. So my theory is maybe that's part of where Eisner got the name of the character, the spirit. Eisner um, was very concerned about anti-Semitism. 
um, as he would have experienced it as a, a Jew living in America uh, leading up to World War II. Here's a guy who likes Will, who hired him to actually uh, uh, do the spirit section, uh, talking about they're pushing America into a war with Germany, a plot engineered by the Jewish bankers. Um, let me tell you, the Jews of this country don't have long to wait. But enough of politics. How about kind of my house for dinner next week? So, you know, this is one of his, uh, you know, this guy liked Will, and even though he probably did know Will was Jewish, just, uh, um, you know, uh, said what he was going to say. And this was obviously a very transformative, transitional moment in Will's life. Um, and you can sort of see Eisner out there in the rain in what Harvey Kurtzman termed Eisenspritz, sort of thinking about it. And, uh, you know, indirectly, this would eventually lead to the last graphic novel that Will finished just uh, shortly before he died. Uh, Will was very upset about the resurgence of this fraudulent document, the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And he did a lot of research and spent a graphic novel. This is pretty good for a guy in his 80s. Look at this art. Look at the, the perspective. Look at the shading. Uh, Will drew this. And uh, there's a character not directly identified with Will, but clearly is Will, is Will going around and, and finding just how uh, pervasive the, uh, the hatred being promoted by the Protocols is. So this was uh, the plot was the last thing Will finished. Will's work inspired many, many graphic novelists. You could do a whole program about that, but I'd say most famously Mouse. Um, uh, which was Art Spiegelman's Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel. Will, as I said, taught a lot. And from that teaching came several textbooks that people consider essential to this day, including comics and sequential art. He was so influential that the Eisner Awards given out every year at the San Diego Comic Convention, which are considered the Oscars of the comic book industry and of the graphic novel industry were named after him. And he was even involved with them long before he died. So there was a period when you could get an Eisner Award from Will Eisner. And there's Will as he looked uh, later in life, sort of echoes that first photo we saw of him drawing. I guess the constant is the drawing board, the paper, and the pen. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. I hope you've learned some interesting and uh, inspiring things about Will Eisner. Um, you can find out more about Will at willeisner.com. You can find out more about me at dannyfingeroth.com. I thank you for your time. I thank Travis Langley for being the behind the scenes tech. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you.